To begin, um, I'm going to bring you through the, uh, the background to the, uh, the, how the church came into being. Um, it was as a result of the efforts of a large number of people, um, patrons, architects, builders, artists and craftsmen, and all working in the context of the 19th century interest in and revival of everything medieval, and influenced by the philosophy of one of the great art critics and philosopher of the time, John Ruskin. So the patron, our patrons were George John Brown, the third, third Marquess of Sligo, and after his death, um, the fourth Marquess, his brother. Uh, he had no daughter, or he had, he had all daughters, no sons, so passed to his, his brother. Um, the, these two men uh, were responsible for um, really driving the project. Um, the church that had been, uh, this is a map of the town, just showing you. The, in 1838, so we're looking at the Ordnance Survey from 1838, and you can see that this is the site of the church here, across from uh, today, today's site, and this one here is the, where the original church was, and the grounds of the, the domain of Westport House. So a couple of things began to, to happen in the, the 1860s in Westport. It was opened up to the world by the, yes? Sorry. Could you use the mic, please? You can't hear me, okay. Um, We've got the mic. Right. Sorry. <laughs> Forgive me while I mic this lady up. <laughs> Take a moment. Okay. Have you a pocket? I've no pocket. I'll hold it. I'll hold it. Okay. The contraption. two doctors in the house, I've got surgical tape here, <laughs> to be applied by a journeyman, like so. Now, you're good to okay. go with any luck. Let's hear you. Is that, can you hear me better? Yes. 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 Okay. And you can hear even a little, a little better again if we do so. Oh yeah, I can you get a job at you too. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'll just go back then. So we have three really significant people involved in bringing the church into, into being. They were the third Marquess of Sligo, um, the architect who was Sir Thomas Newton Dean, and the, um, the design philosophy of John Ruskin. And I was just pointing out to you the location of the church, the site where the church actually stands today is across from the school. So the school was, was there in 1838 and there was a, a gate lodge into Westport House and this is the, the site of the, um, the original church. So in the 1860s, this is the, as it was, this is an archival photograph of the original church um, which was rebuilt in 1797. We don't know who the architect was um, then or who, who the previous uh, architect was for, for the church before that, but the, uh, it was felt that the, church, the town was really opening up because of the railways. So the railways, 1866 the railway came to Westport and there was a sense that um, the church needed to expand um, and that's, that was really the driver behind it and also the, the, excuse, the perennial excuse behind um, uh, deciding to build a new building and move away from an old one, it was felt that it was falling down and it was in, in disrepair. Um, so the, uh, the other thing, the organ here, which was um, installed in that church in memory of um, Marchioness of Sligo on her death in 1852, that organ was threatened by the damp in the church. So that's one of the reasons that they decided to, to, to push for building a new one. So this, the Lord Sligo um, promoted this uh, project. Uh, and commit, or, um, committed £1,200 to it. The ecclesiastical commissioners then were um, uh, contacted to uh, look for funding and they gave £2,400. And altogether, with subscriptions from the parishioners on top of that, the entire cost of the church was £4,500. Um, that's before the interior decoration is, is taken into consideration. And the interior was decorated over the, the, the subsequent 20 years. So 1872 is the date that the church was actually consecrated. Um, 
this is the church today in, in the grounds, what remains of it. So it's uh, still a little bit of it there to be seen if you wander around the, the estate. So this is a 1900 map of the, the town showing the location now of the church. You can all see it there, Holy Trinity Church is clearly marked out on, 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 the, on the map. So um, just a little bit about Sir Thomas Newman Dean then. He was the other uh, great uh, person behind the, the design of the project, behind the, the project. He was, um, uh, he, 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 was a summer practice which was very, very famous at the time, Dean and Woodward. Um, his father, Thomas Dean, uh, together with Woodward, had designed the, uh, the Oxford Museum, uh, Oxford University Museum. And <coughs> Thomas Dean and Dean was also responsible for the Museum of Trinity College Dublin. He was responsible for the, um, some detail there, for Turlock House. So this is uh, Turlock Park House, rather. So, um, Dean was, um, he was, was steeped in the design uh, practice of, of Woodward. Really, Woodward was the designer in that practice. Um, and it was, it, it had evolved really out of the, uh, the philosophy of, of Ruskin. Ruskin worked directly with um, the Deans, uh, or Dean and Woodward, on the, um, on the design of the Oxford Museum. So, um, just another bit before we move on to Ruskin, Dean, um, as well as running a very busy practice, he, um, he was also a inspector of national monuments. So he's very familiar with the, the whole um, of, uh, I suppose, medieval architecture. And like the 19th century was a time of the revival of, as I said earlier, everything medieval. Um, and Dean and Woodward were part of that. The, um, I suppose one of the uh, characteristics of their architecture is um, decorative carving um, and um, this is something that, that they would have they would have looked to Ruskin's Stones of Venice, his publication Stones of Venice, uh, for inspiration. Uh, of, uh, the, 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 the style was drawn from Venetian Gothic. Um, He, the good thing to say about Dean, sorry I've moved on to Ruskin again, was that he had a very keen interest in painting. Between 1863 and 1898, he was a regular exhibitor at the Royal Burnian Academy, and he believed that um, architects should have a broad education, which included fine art and the study of the antique. And in 1875, he argued for the establishment of a good technical school of art, um, where the smith, the carpenter, the carver, the weaver, the builder, the decorator, the architectural student, could see examples of um, such objects as may help them to form right conclusions as to what is right, wrong, beautiful, and ugly. So he was he was very much an artist. Dean. He was shy and retiring. He didn't want to be an architect. His father pushed him into the practice, um, and uh, which he, he went along with. He remained an architect until his dying day. But essentially, he was a painter. I think you can see from the interior of the church that that is what comes through. It's a painterly style and um, colour was very important. Decorative detail was very important to, to Dean. Um, he was really interested in ensuring that craftsmen were trained in good design and aesthetics and those chosen for this the contract for Holy Trinity were um, of the very best quality and carved, um, the carved stone work in particular uh, is really a virtuoso display um, of uh, the beauty and the liveness of the natural world. So to really to, to give you a background then to where all of this style had come from. John Ruskin was hugely influential, um, a hugely influential character in the 19th century. He had been variously described as art critic, art patron, social thinker and philanthropist. His writings defended the work of J.M.W. Turner, who he admired uh, for the truth to nature in his work, something which Ruskin argued was the principal role of the artist. He sparked the arts and crafts movement, supported the pre-Raphaelite brother brotherhood, and contributed to the development of a style of architecture known as the Athenian Gothic. Um, his, which this is a, a, a really true and perfect example of that style, this building. His ideas and concerns are now widely recognised as having anticipated 
uh, interested in environmentalism, sustainability and craft, um, and he believed that business should be sympathetic to their environment and use local materials. He was really modern, in other words. He brought about the shift that took place in the 19th century, away from um, imitating past styles into um, looking at uh, vernacular buildings and moving forward then into arts and crafts and finally to modernism in the early 20th century. So he was really a, a huge um, move maker in those terms and this building at that time represented that um, uh, I, the ideas of really getting back to basics in architecture um, a, a express, expressing reality, uh, truth to nature was very very important uh, in his philosophy. Um, in 1851-53, he published The Stones of Venice, in which he wrote about it. He was, was the other uh, part of his design philosophy is that it was, very, it was full of religious fervour. Um, he wrote about the decline in the moral and spiritual health of society, which reflects his and later Thomas Newman Dean's ideas um, on the necessary training for craftsmen. Um, this is interesting, he wrote, we want one man to be always thinking and another to be always working and we call one a gentleman and the other an operative, whereas the workman ought to be often thinking and the thinker ought to be working, and both should be gentlemen in the best sense. So there was a real sense that they, there was a, a, um, a morality attached to the craftsman being directly involved, <coughs> that, that um, there was an honesty about, uh, about the building. The decorative expression then um, within Holy Trinity Church follows the philosophy of Ruskin, uh, and the desire for a return to a handcrafted work based on natural forms and a move away from mass, produ mass production of industrialization. So really it was a rail against the industrial world and a desire for a return to um, the, the direct involvement of the craftsmen. The, the, the whole idea was that the Gothic um, buildings had been built for the, to the glory of God. We don't know the names of any of the architects of the great Gothic cathedrals um, by the time we moved into the Renaissance era, um, the human, human was the centre of the universe and God had, had moved to the periphery. So we know the names of all of the architects. The architects were God. They, they put themselves in, into the centre of the picture. And Ruskin argued that we should be moving back to this idea that, um, the, um, that man is not central and that um, the, the, the role of, of, of the craftsman is, is everything. Um, in his Seven Lamps of Architecture, he says that rather than spending our money on needless and often ugly embellishments for our home, we should give it to the church in order to provide a splendid interior for the worship of God, <coughs> that would be a joy and a blessing. Um, he believed that the truest architecture was the older Gothic of the medieval cathedrals, and particularly of Venice. He loved Venice, he travelled, he, um, he drew Venice, he's, he's, he, was a, he was an incredible person who not only wrote, but he, um, he was an artist, he produced illustrations and really closely observed illustrations of, um, of architectural detail, botanical detail, and he, his idea was that the illustration was about the act of observing and the, um, the actual finished product didn't really matter, it was all about observation and um, recognising the, 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 the detail in everything. He suggested an honest architecture with no veneers, finishes, hidden support, no machine mouldings, and um, that beauty must be derived from nature and crafted by man. And Ruskin argued that the technical innovations of architecture since the Renaissance, and particularly the Industrial Revolution, had subsumed its spiritual content and sapped it of its vitality. Um, the, so there was a direct connection between this man the reason of, I'm going into to Ruskin's ideas and philosophy is that there is an absolute, the strongest connection um, between him and Dean and Woodward, the practice. Um, he um, would have, they, he worked directly with them on the Oxford Museum, uh, Oxford University Museum, and he, um, you know, the, 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 the elements of that building embody his writings, the, 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 the philosophy of his writings. Um, just to a, a note then on um, the, um, the ecclesiastical commissioners and their involvement, the, uh, this 
drawing here. By the way, the drawings for the church are in the representative church body library, so they do exist. There, there are a, a number of contract drawings which are um, which are available, and uh, we have most of a few of them are, are illustrated in the in the exhibition down below. But they um, they're signed by Wellington Gillespie, not by the architects, not by Sir Thomas Newman Dean. Uh, the idea behind that is that they were the um, overseeing architects for the grant of money that was coming from the Ecclesiastical Commission and they were fully in control, they were the civil servants um, and held full um, responsibility <coughs> for the execution of the sign. It's just a little interesting aside um, in relation to Ellen and Gillespie that they um, uh, would have done the same for uh, the Church of St. Bartholomew in Clyde Road in Dublin, which is designed by Wyatt. And he was working in, in England at the time, um, a well known London architect at the time. And um, the, the drawings for that church were signed by Wellington Gillespie, and it upset Wyatt to no, no end. Um, he wasn't a bit pleased when he found his name omitted from the final plans, and he wrote, Not a word has ever been said to me as to my being expected to furnish plans be carried out under the direction of superintendents of others. If I had, if it had, if it had, I should have respectfully declined the honour of such employment. And it was from the fact that such an arrangement being entirely unexpected by me, and from the apparent coolness with which my name was struck out, without one word of explanation or regret, that I naturally felt aggrieved at what appeared to be a professional slight. So you can tell from the wording of that how strongly why I felt about having his name having been omitted. Um, so that's why these drawings don't have Thomas Newman Dean's name on them, but they do have, have uh, well, Gillespie. And um, they're signed by John Butler as well. On the right hand side there, you can see John Butler's name. He was the builder of the, um, he was the builder. This, the, every drawing has this, plans are referred to in the article of agreement dated the 7th of April, 1869, um, John Butler. So, um, the architectural design of the church then, it takes the form of a single cell structure finishing in a polygonal apse. So this is our three-sided apse here. Uh, the choice of three sides, no doubt, symbolizing the dedication to the Holy Trinity. The almost freestanding tower is also polygonal. It's essentially an octagon. You can see a plan of it in the drawing here. And it's surmounted by a really elegant and slender pencil spire. Um, and although an article in the Mayo Examiner from the, the time that the church was consecrated in September 1872 um, states that the height was 185 feet, um, according to the contract drawings, the spire was built to rise 126 feet from the ground, the actual spire itself measuring 70 feet and sitting on top of a 56 foot high bell tower. So we have uh, at least what was intended to be built. We know it was 126 feet high, whether that's actually what happened in the end or not. It remains to be tested by triangulation <laughs> by some enthusiastic person. Um, the spire is visible from nearly all approaches to the church in Westport, not just a, a thing of beauty. It locates the building with great clarity within the landscape and acts as a campanile or bell tower, calling the people to worship. So true to Roskinian principles, again, it is both beautiful and functional. The church isn't symmetrical, um, which uh, it's, a it's a regular and it's a deliberately picturesque way, um, which is advocated by the theorists of the time um, as being most suitable and correct. So we have the asymmetry, even though we have basically a single cell structure. We have the spire off to one side here, the, the, the tower rather, just attached, barely attached to the building. And we have the transept, the north transept and vestry, on the north side, so there is a there is a, a very subtle asymmetry to the structure. Externally, the church is four bays long, which you can see in this uh, illustration, this drawing of the, of the south elevation of the church. The bay divisions are marked by buttresses with um, with pointed coping stones, which rise the full height of the parapet wall. The very steep state slate roof. Um, it is, is very impressive. Its height from parapet to ridge is almost equal to the height of the walls of the church, the ridge line marking the baseline of the spire. 
The red sand colour of the decorative stone dressings and particularly the window tracery enliven the sombre colour of the local sand sandstone from which the church is built. The rusticated ashlar masonry of the exterior. So what do I mean by rusticated ashlar? This is an illustration of the, the uh, photograph of the exterior. Rust rustication literally means rough uh, treatment of the surface of the stone. It's not smooth ashlar which would, would denote a smooth surface. And this is deliberate. One thing about this building is that every, um, everything about it is a deliberate choice. And the choice of rusticated masonry was the only building that Thomas Newman Dean actually designed with this type of, of rusticated surface it was to represent a parochial church, a rustic church. Um, and again, following the precepts of fusion, the idea was that a church or any building should be, and particularly a church, should be um, built to suit its position in life. But this isn't a cathedral, it's a small parish church. So that's the reason for, for the rusticated ma uh, masonry. Um, the doorways then with their very steep gable are re steep gables are reminiscent of the Romanesque Cormac's Chapel in County Tipperary. And as already noted, Thomas Newman Dean, inspector of national monuments um, <coughs> from 1875, just after when this church was built. So he would have been very familiar anyway with everything Gothic and everything medieval in the country. Um, his, all of his, his, he was a cathedral restorer. He restored St. Francis Cathedral in Kilkenny, um, St. Mary's Cathedral in Tune. Um, so he was very aware of um, the, the medieval in Ireland. It's a really lovely. Uh, uh, reference to one of the great buildings um, of the, one of the um, great me medieval buildings of the country. Um, on either side of the doors are carved panels running to ground level feature also found in the museum building of Trinity College and the iron doors themselves are exceptionally beautiful. Um, we have an illustration of the iron, the heat. this is something that Dean and Woodward pioneered. The carving is, is exceptional in the church and extremely redolent of the style. Um, I'll just go back to here. Um, you have the, uh, over the, the tympanum over the uh, south door has a representation of sheep with wheat representing autumn and on the, the doorway into the, um, into the tower, the bell tower, on the east side of the building here, you have a pelican represented. Um, and this is a, a synonym or an allegory of the, uh, of the sacrifice of Christ that the pelican would pierce his own breast to feed his young. Um, the, the pelican is surrounded by uh, grapes and vine leaves and he appears again in one of these bases of the columns, all of the, the bases of the columns in the uh, in the nave are carved with not just foliage uh, of many different types of plant, but also many contain um, animals uh, represented in the stonework. The um, the interior of the church then is um, is. Just sorry, one last thing before I go, it, 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 it hook up with the, with the interior. Sorry, I go back to my hammer beam roof. Just explanation. So this is, I thought, a very uh, interesting way of looking, of understanding the construction of the church. That uh, we have a section here through the building, looking in west, looking in that direction, and you can see how the roof is constructed. You have a what's known as hammer beam Gothic ceiling uh, inside the pitched, steep, really steeply pitched roof. You can walk between these two leaves. Um, I'll show you later this photograph of a walkway which has been inserted, or, or at least it was always there, but it's just been made safer so that people can easily access the roof and get out uh, through new access after the theme of the really essential maintenance that the church requires. But this just shows you how, um, how the, the, the ceiling actually works. The hammer beam roof then is a typical of English Gothic architecture and um, short beams project from either side. You can see it's really well illustrated and I'm capable of showing you uh, the horizontal members that are the actual hammer beams. Um, and these land, uh, these are essentially uh, a, a tie beam that's been cut in the middle um, and hence the need for the 
the buildings be tied together at a later date, possibly, by these um, uh, uh, steel members or iron uh, tie bars. The, one of the, 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 steep, the issues of the hammer beam roof is that the thrust, the outer thrust, is, is, is very great. Uh, and this type of this sort of remedial effort is often needed to, to tie the whole thing back together. But it, what it does do is it gives the space this huge um, sense of, of airiness. It's not a big church, but it feels spacious when you're inside it. Uh, and this is really down to the hammer beam roof construction. Uh, so not only does it give, uh, not only is it a reference, a really um, open reference to, to English Gothic style, but it creates this wonderful atmosphere. We don't have any side aisles, we don't have columns, which then would block the light and, and create a darker environment. Um, so that's just a, a little, there are the tie beams. You can see them here, we don't need to illustrate them in the photograph. Um, and just a word on the, the two stones that were used in the building, they're both sandstone. They're the detail, the stone detail and the tracery is a different colour. The lovely soft colour is everywhere in this church. This warmth of reds, which really, I suppose, that flows in the interior, is there on the outside in a really subtle way in, in the use of this soft sandstone. They're both sandstone in like a way. It looks, may look like a granite, the rusticated masonry. But it's sandstone apparently from Toe, the Toe Head Quarry out in Lewisburg. I don't know if you're familiar with that location, but the, we don't know where the, um, the softer stone came from, the softer sandstone for the, for the windows. But one, one thing we do know is that it was, it was chosen deliberately for its, its ease of carving. Um, so that, you know, the, 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 the carvers of spoken could achieve this beautiful detail. And the disadvantage to that, of course, is that it's weathering really badly, especially on the south side of the building, which gets all of the, the southwest and the and it's not so bad on the north side. But that's one of the issues that's going to have to be looked at in the conservation plan. And for Southgate, the conservation engineer is drawing up a, um, a conservation method statement for the repair of the building, of the, the windows under this uh, heritage management grant. So that's the next step in a phased conservation of the church, which will hopefully take place next year, um, because they're really in, in very poor, uh, in very bad condition. Um, the interior then is uh, lined with, um, with it's covered with decoration. It's lined on the walls with these incredible marble murals, white marble murals, which were produced by the church decorator Samuel Poole of London. Um, and they represent um, line drawings. They're in the style of line illustrations by the, the English illustrator, 18th century English illustrator John Blackman. And the, the choice of, of this, this illustrator is it, they're, they're um, high Renaissance classical. So all of a sudden we've moved from this real preponderance of Gothic into Renaissance. And <coughs> it's something that is, I suppose, Ruskin was a contradiction in terms in many ways, but he um, espoused the, the illustration, uh, the, 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 um, the capabilities of, of Blacksman as being um, one of his favourite, favourite illustrators. So this is where the, these come from. They're made of Carrara marble. They're incised with um, this uh, cement, the, 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 the incisions are, are, are filled with, with the black cement and their background is, is gold leaf. And they um, they were put they were put up within a very short space of time. Uh, literally, the north and south walls were, were in place by the end of the 1870s, and then by the end of the 1880s, the west wall, with its its incredible uh, representation of, of the Last Supper, um, was uh, was put in place. So the uh, most of them are this incredible. Um, uh, classical, but this one is an example. This is in the far corner, um, down by the west wall on the north side of the building. And it's an exact copy of a painting by William Holman Hunt, uh, one of the pre-Raphaelites. And as the name suggests, suggests pre-Raphaelites, these painters were going back to before Raphael, before the High Renaissance, and they were returning to um, a, uh, a time before all of that sensuousness that, that 
this um, that Ruskin believed was sort of a moral problem with uh, with, with art and architecture. They um, the figure in this work, uh, his clothes, clothing, and the attent attentively observed um, and definitely expressed plant life is in the pre raphaelite style. And it turns out that this is a, as I said, is a copy of The Light of the World, which is there on the right hand side by William Holman Hunt, one of the three Raphaelites, the other two being John Edward Mie and, um, <coughs> and uh, Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Now, these were all friends of uh, Ruskin's, and the reason they were friendly with him was obviously he espoused what they were doing because they were reacting against the Salon of Paris and against the Academy in London, which was very much all about um, structure in painting, composition, rules, following these essentially rules of, of, of art. And this was the 19th century, the time when there was a break away from all of that. And Turner was the, the beginnings of that break from tradition and moving towards representing nature and representing the world in a very immediate way and a very engaging way. And uh, uh, Ruskin, the art critic, he made, uh, he could make or break an artist's career by what he wrote and he supported Turner, the likes of Turner and the three Raphaelites and therefore they were able to survive and sell their paintings um, because of, of what he had to, it, the support that he gave them. And he was close, Ruskin was closest in his temperament to William Holman Hunt out of the three of the three Raphaelites and he had a he didn't exactly have a close relationship with them throughout his life, but he, he, uh, they came to be very close friends after about 30 years of knowing each other. Um, but they were both very uh, full of religious fervor, and this painting is, 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 is really a representation of that. It was a very famous work um, at the time, and it, it, it toured, uh, toured all around England, certainly possibly further afield in Europe. Um, the, uh, the original work, is an allegorical painting representing the figure of Jesus preparing to knock on an overgrown and long and opened door and illustrating Revelation 3.20 um, which um, and Ruskin, or sorry, Holman Hunt explained that the door in the painting has no handle and can therefore be opened only from the inside and um, re representing the obstinately shut mind. So, and Val had a lovely addition to that earlier on which I hope you might enlighten us a bit later. Um, it's just the, 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 little, the little addition to the Revelation quote are the words, the voice of my beloved that knocketh it straight from uh, the Song of Songs, that highly erotic, uh, grateful uh, Hebrew poetry, which then spiritual writers took in allegorical form and, and so on. And sometimes because they were nervous of the sensuality, and sometimes because they appreciate it. Thank you, Val. Thank you. Great. Um, this is just a, another um, example of the, the works. This is the allegory of the, um, uh, sorry, the parable of the wheat and Taurus. And I just um, wanted to draw your attention to the fact that the, there are many parables represented in the, the murals that are picked up again in the uh, in the stained glass, and we can see that one of these is just over there. So I tell you the reality. On the screen, on the second page then, um, of the book, and it is the equivalent parable to the stained glass window on the far side of the church, with the angels at the at the very the very top of the, in the eight foil part of that, that window which is the illustration we used for the, for the publication, for the, for the uh, sign outside. Um, so it just shows the variety of ways of interpreting one, simple, one single story. And it, it occurs again and again throughout the church. You can see uh, an incredible array of, of different approaches to, to representing the same theme. This is just an example of the carved detail. It's a really bad, sorry for blown up a picture of a crocodile. You can just about see a crocodile with a frog in its mouth. Um, so representing the, the plate of Egypt. Bottom, bottom right. Yeah, bottom. We, we wonder if it is the yes. plates of Egypt that they refer to. The plates of Egypt uh, at the time the Hebrews were in captivity. The apse decoration then, just actually before I move on, so the, the, the main uh, 
uh, thrust of the decoration here is this, these beautiful marble murals, um, but they are ordered by the, uh, the architectural structure of the building. So you have the columns keeping everything um, shepherded and in train, and this is all there for a reason. It's all visibly supporting this, the, the trust, this, this, this openly visible trust system, the, uh, the early English Gothic hammer beam roof. So everything is open and visible and form follows function. These are all ideas that are very, I suppose that they weren't new, and um, they go back to the origins of Gothic architecture, but they were being brought back and uh, espoused and were to, to become the essence of modern modern architecture. So really we're looking at something that is is in, in, in its philosophy is very, very ahead of its time. We're looking to have the an example of it here in Westport. Um, the uh, the apps then behind me is uh, um, again it is the most decorative part of the church. So even though it's highly decorated in, in, in the nave, the ceiling is, is undecorated. Whereas when we move into the apse, every single inch of space is covered with some form of decoration. So the lower at the lower level we have this beautiful red bin for our marble, which um, was um, which came there's a story, there are stories that, that, they, that there were Italians working on the church and that they um, took a three hour lunch break before, <laughs> and this was a, a apparently to sleep off their wine. This was one of the stories that, that, that abounded about the, the church. But certainly it's, it's a beautiful um, coloured marble and it's deliberately chosen, the red vein is deliberately chosen to, to suit the, the decorative scheme of the church. And above that then we've got the mosaics um, the uh, four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, and we have uh, Moses and David in the span of Arch and Sunny <coughs> and Paul and Peter um, on, on the outside. And what makes these different? So this, everything is a step up in terms of decoration when we move into the sanctuary. And what makes this different here is the um, the, the mosaics in the background. To these figures are, are sorry, the, the gold is on. Pieces, mosaic pieces, which are set at different angles so that they catch the light. And um, as, as you move, the, the background appears to move because of the way it reflects light. And so the, the figures appear to almost shimmer and hover above. So they're, they become otherworldly and appropriate to, to who they are. Um, the ceiling of the apse then is a, um, a probably a wallpaper from William Morris's. Um, Designs. We don't know. We don't know that for sure. There's not, no, nothing. No record of where it came from. But certainly, it is. Um, it's absolutely in his style. And again, picks up the, the swirling temple motifs. Pick up on the um, on the marble inlay in the panels between the um, either side of the windows and between the the, uh, the evangelists. Um, the organ I've already mentioned. The stained glass then, the stained glass in the church is was carried out by three different companies. So they're all, it's all English, English 19th century stained glass. And David Lawrence has done a, uh, he's an expert on the history of stained glass in both England and Ireland. And on behalf of the representative church body, he's done a survey of this church, but not just this church, of all church island churches in Ireland, north and south. It's a really comprehensive survey. You can all see it online. It's available to view on glina.ie, it's the name of the website. So you can look at any church in Ireland, in Church Barnum Church, and see the, the, the stained glass. But um, he, uh, he's done a little bit of an appraisal of the, of, uh, the significance of the windows. And he, um, he writes that, um, he really discusses the lack of attention that's been given to 19th century um, stained glass artists um, because they've, they've just been considered Victorian, so, or at least just Victorian, mm -hmm. and as such not particularly worthy of our attention, our consideration, especially compared to medieval work, um, or to the work of the very highly regarded Harry Clark Studios of the 20th century here in Ireland. So we tend to get very excited when we hear it's the Harry Clark of the church, but um, actually these windows possibly because we, we regard them firstly as Victorian, secondly they're also English, they're foreign, and um, we don't give, pay them as much attention. But as soon as you start looking in them at, more detail, uh, at them in more detail, you realise how um, incredibly well designed, composed and 
uh, the materials that they're made of are, are, are carefully, very carefully devised and thought out. Um, and this is really something that Lawrence, David Lawrence has, has brought to light in his, uh, his study. Um, so and he, he states, those who thought that only medieval stained glass was of importance are beginning to have the veils pulled from their eyes. Um, so we're extremely lucky again to have a complete set of Clayton and Bell um, uh, windows and these were put into the church. So the first two windows to be, to be installed in the church were the rose window at the back, the west wall, a beautiful rose window. And this window here, the one closest to, to the apse, these were by William Wales from Newcastle upon Tyne, the centre the center of, of bottle making. So the 19th century was a, a time of great uh, revival of the, of the art of stained glass, and it was also the time a time of industrialisation, of, of innovation in terms of, of uh, metal work and glass production. And all of these things came together with the publication also by um, Charles Winston had a huge interest. He was a lawyer who had a, an interest in the hobby in, in understanding medieval stained glass in particular. And he published the, uh, this uh, publication from the medieval treatise on diverse arts, which um, Theophilus's diverse arts, which tells about the, um, the techniques, and one of them being stained glass techniques. So um, Clayton and Bell particularly picked up on this publication, and <coughs> they uh, realised that the modern way of making glass was actually uh, didn't have the light refracting qualities that medieval glass did and so they went back and looked at how it was made and um, how medieval glass was made and they they just they made their own glass and um, often church decorating firms may have uh, taken used glass from elsewhere but Clayton and Bell pioneered this method to, to create this really beautiful and it, it gives a very dual life quality to the to the windows and um, they were a hugely successful firm producing uh, work for all over the world, it's exported to places like Canada, New Zealand, and um, it's incredible to think of stained glass being, you know, shipped off to the four corners of the world in the 1870s, um, but that's that's what they were up to. They had 300 people at the height of their, um, their powers, I suppose, uh, in, in, in employment in the firm, and they worked through the night, they had night shifts to, to, to produce the work. So there's a huge demand for this, this type of thing, huge, huge demand for this huge revival in church building. And, um, and also the, the, the restoration of a lot of medieval cathedrals as well as taking place. So the, this is William Wales, um, <coughs> Peter at the Gate, and this is where that, that section comes from. So it's these windows here, so it's a very particular style. And you notice instantly how different the Clayton and Bell windows are. A beautiful, beautiful, this is my favorite um, of all of the windows. So each window has nine scenes roughly nine or, or seven or eight, uh, some of them, most of them have nine. So you have three lances, each with three scenes. So the building is packed, the windows are packed with stories. And this is, the, the achievement of these windows is that it's all done with order. So you have a huge amount of uh, illustration within a tiny space. This one is the wise and foolish virgins with their, their oil lamps and wonderful uh, composition. Um, another example, and the miracle, the, sorry, the parable of the Wheaton Towers. The other artist then, uh, the other studio that produced stained glass at the church was um, Alexander Gibbs, and he produced two windows, which are on the, the north wall at the far end of the church. And they, there are cartoons in the Westport State Papers which represent the um, two designs, two versions of these windows. And what's different about them then to the Clayton and Bell is they have these wonderful full height uh, lancets, so one scene uh, per lancet, and they appear to, um, uh, the story appears to unfold across the window, and so even though it doesn't actually happen like that, it appears, to, um, the composition appears to, to, to take place across the three. So it's a very different style again, um, and a uh, very interesting approach. These two little ones are from a church in Belfair that had associations with Livingston, another of the benefactors of the church, um, who contributed. He was, he was a, um, worked, uh, had the distillery on Distillery Road, so he was a wealthy, wealthy um, business owner who uh, contributed first of all to the building of the church and then to its decoration. 
he provided the money for the, the pulpit, uh, for the lectern, and um, this is the, these stained glass are in the north transept, representing St. Patrick and St. George from um, Belclare, the church in Belclare. So the conservation works to the church then, um, I'll just run through this very briefly. The, uh, in 1984, the church was restored, the works were carried out, and we were very lucky to have actually found a set of papers in um, the Irish Architectural Archive, which are a full set of correspondence between the architect who oversaw the conservation works in 1984, Featherstone, um, and these are going to be of huge use to us in understanding what works were actually done, and what materials were used, um, uh, and how we would be able to have a clear understanding um, then of, of possible problems that have arisen out of those works. We've already, we can already see some issues that are likely to, to be related to works that were carried out in the 1980s and that's not due to any lack of attention or care that, was, that would have uh, gone on at the time. It's, it's simply because our understanding of materials and historic buildings has changed in the last 20 years uh, in Ireland uh, with the, um, I suppose, the, the whole growth in the area of conservation. The, um, the works in 2014 then are um, essentially they were done following publication of a report by Chris Southgate in 2013 who identified the main issue with the church was the fact that um, there was a huge amount of water getting into the building, particularly on the south wall and he identified the issue of the spaces between the windows were where most of that, um, that moisture ingress was occurring. So uh, he, um, he realised that the parapet wall had a damp roof course um, which didn't follow through into the buttresses. So the, the areas between the windows are where the buttresses are located on the outside of the building. And Chris Southgate uh, um, looked at, at what was happening and realised that the, a possible solution to this was to carry through the damp roof course into the, the tops of the buttresses. And this is a good illustration of the north. This is taken on the north side of the building very recently from the scaffolding that was there. And you can see this a, a, a lead damp roof course running where it should, but on the parapet wall. You can see that it stops here, it doesn't run through into the buttress. This is the top of the buttress. And this is what is believed to be the, the issue that the buttresses were filling with water and they. Um, any um, internal uh, fill had washed out over the years or had, 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 had disintegrated. And so they were, they were pumped with uh, low pressure with a grout, as well as this, this new um, damp roof course being, being laid. So here we have uh, the drawings. They're really useful and they show the problem. They show the, the issue at a design stage. They just didn't follow them through. They didn't follow through. With the, uh, so this is a, a section through the current wall. So we're looking at the, uh, the side elevation of the buttress here. You can see this fine um, lead flashing is, is, is the words that are written there, not followed through into the buttress. So well done for Chris Southgate, Chris Southgate for, for spotting it. Um, and uh, this is the works being undertaken. Uh, this is a view of the the copper and um, the copper valleys and parapet others, and these were also renewed in 2014. And um, this is this, this incredible walkway that exists between the leaves of the ceiling and the, the roof itself. And um, this was renewed and, and made safe in 2014. And this was really really important because it, it helps to make it easy to get access to the roof to carry out essential functions. <coughs> And the parapet gutters fill every summer, every autumn, and every spring with, with leaves, with um, debris from the trees. And it's essential that they're cleared out twice a year in order to keep the water free flowing away from the building. Um, it's really simple, but it's, uh, if you can't get up there, then it's, if, it, if it's costly to hire a cherry picker or to, to, to put up scaffolding, it won't be done. <coughs> so, this is simple but effective um, use of, of funds to. You know, to, to increase the, the ease of maintenance of the church. This is one of the access hatches that was put in, with one on the north and one on the south side installed, so access can be gained to, to both sides of the church. 
Um, the, the downpipes on the, these are all the original cast iron beautiful uh, square section uh, down, cast iron downpipes um, and these were renewed on the south elevation in 2014 and just recently the scaffolding outside here on the north side of the building doing the same thing. The, um, this shows a tiny little, this is how subtle the work is, very carefully done. So this little hole here is where the grout was would have been poked through. So really subtle and careful um, work. This is the team. This, these are the people involved in the conservation of the church. Uh, Chris Southgate on the right hand side, Stevie Brickenden, um, and Siobhan Sexton, the conservation officer, architectural conservation officer for <coughs> uh, Mayo County Council, and of course Simon Wall, town architect. Um, the works in 2016 then, this is the recent works that were, were done, if you, Wanted to have a look later, you can see where there was water pouring in in the north transept here at the, the junction between the transept and the, the nave, uh, the main body of the church itself, right underneath the chimney stack. Um, I didn't tell you the story about eating the church, which is of just anecdotal interest that there's a furnace underneath the, the vestry which uh, was turf fired originally and it took. Um, a day and a half and two cartloads of turf to heat the church for Sunday service. So that's a little, a little story. But this, so there's a, a massive chimney over the side of the building, which was through which water was pouring in. So the flashing on top of the chimney, and um, the chimney pots, the uh, and the the pointing on this section of the building was was causing huge problems with with water getting in. And this is in the, uh, a photograph of the works finished, completed, the, the pointing completed, and it's really beautiful pointing. Um, uh, it had been, it's possibly, the work possibly dated to the, the 1980s, so we had this really hard mortar.